At first glance, Nuclear Blaze looks like a pretty by-the-numbers 2D action game. A pixelated sprite runs left to right across the screen, jumping over platforms. But what sets the game apart is that the enemy you're shooting at isn't an alien army or a swarm of monsters. It's fire. In Nuclear Blaze, you play as a firefighter called into the woods to combat a wildfire. But soon you find yourself separated from your comrades and in an unmarked bunker that seems to be the source of the flames. As you progress through the levels of the base, the true nature of the blaze is revealed. And not all is as it seems. Things start out simply enough. Spray the fire with water until it's gone, then the fire doors will unlock and you can move to the next section. But the game quickly complicates matters, because the fire in the game does spread if left unattended, and there will be gas mains that continue to produce fire until you get the valve to them shut off, undoing any progress you've made so far, or levels so large that you can't easily put everything out at once and you need to activate fire suppression systems to help cover areas for you. It is, in a lot of ways, a territory capture game, and there's always something satisfying about purifying a room or hallway and making it safe for traversal. You can almost think of it like a 2D action version of Viscera cleanup detail in some ways. You need to figure out how to use your water hose to purge the environment of that which sullies it, but often enough you'll end up making additional messes that need to be cleaned up as the flames grow and backdrafts blow into other rooms that you've previously cleared. The game also has these really nice difficulty adjustments, allowing you to make the game easier by giving yourself the opportunity to survive a few hits of fire or have extra water, or you can make the game more difficult by having fire spread much faster, or having no warning when the ground beneath you is about to light a flame. There's even a special mode just for kids that has its own levels and auto-aim and invulnerability that's all about saving kittens, which are the hidden bonus items in the main game. And for a two hour little experience, it's a pretty fully featured package. If I had one complaint, it'd probably be the pacing. Despite being a relatively short experience, the game starts teasing its SCP influences early on and doesn't really pay them off until the last fifth or so of the game. And in the meantime, it feels like you're just finding variations on the same note over and over again, warning of an ominous flame artifact at the heart of the blaze without any forward narrative progression, just more labs in which to put fires out. Which is fine because it's fun to put the fires out. From a play perspective, Nuclear Blaze totally works. It's solid action puzzle stuff. But an hour and a half of repetitious hinting about what's to come that amounts to a bit of a gag reveal does sort of drag the whole thing down. It's a shame there aren't any actual characters we're learning about in these logs or even references to other experiments. We even run into a living human exactly once who refuses to leave their hiding spot and we just abandoned them, which felt odd for a firefighter to do. Still, I really enjoyed my time with it. If you're looking for an action puzzle game you can beat in an evening that has some terrific accessibility options, Nuclear Blaze might be worth checking out. There's something about territory capture that I've always loved, from Splatoon to Civilization to Doom, and being able to use a hose to cleanse an area, to purify it, to mark it as mine, and push back the corrosive touch of flames feels really satisfying in ways that are hard to express. Aim training games are increasingly common, on Steam and elsewhere, with promises of helping you improve your FPS skills and edge out the competition in your multiplayer game of choice. And I don't know, maybe they do. I can't find any studies on it, but surely practice whipping a mouse around has to count for something. But whether they help your skills or not, these games aren't typically fun? Interesting? They're training tools more than anything else, a means of honing your reflexes and timing through repetitive motions and a way of building up muscle memory so that headshots just come naturally. And let's be honest, they're also aimed at late teen and early 20 something players who still have the reflexes to hone to a competitive level, not schlubby guys pushing 40 like I am. So I hadn't really put thought into most FPS aim games. That is, at least until I tried Raze. <laughs> Now, Raze is decidedly not an aim training tool, per se. It doesn't track stats, or do headshots versus body shots training, or track overscan versus underscan when acquiring a target, which are all cool things those tools do, but none of that happens here. Instead, Raze is kind of like if an aim training game met something like Super Hexagon. Each level has a series of glowing orange targets to shoot, and when you hit them, it confers some speed to you while setting your direction straight towards where you shot. The goal is to swing from target to target in order to get to the level's exit before time runs out. But if you miss a shot or apply the brakes, you both lose speed and your current combo. So to beat a level requires some skill, but to get a high score requires finesse. This is really simple as far as first-person shooty games go, but really effective? 
It's an intense high score game with short levels designed to be played over and over and over again for faster times with fewer misses and more targets hit, and it proudly displays your leaderboard status as you climb the ranks both on individual levels and your overall game-wide score. And because this is a comparatively unknown indie title, it's not that hard to reach the top 200 or so on the leaderboard, which is always kind of fun. And this high-energy, need-for-speed gameplay is elevated by some high-tempo techno songs that might not add up to a soundtrack as cohesive as something like Chipsil's Super Hexagon soundtrack or Danny Baranowski's Super Meat Boy soundtrack, but songs like Disco Science keep the sense of speed high even as you're learning new maps. There really isn't too much to the game, but that's kind of what I love about it. There aren't customizable beam colors or unlockable power-ups or class-based character actions. There's barely even a story, which is told through loading screens on each level. But I think the bare-bones package is to raise his benefit. It puts the core loop of fast-paced first-person aim racing front and center, and when, after the 20th quick restart of a level, you're finally able to shave off a half a second on your most recent run and climb 10 more slots on the leaderboards while a techno song thumps along to your quickening pulse, it can be exhilarating, and you can feel like the coolest person in the room. In a way, it does what Rock Band did for conveying the sense of being a famous rock star without having to know how to play any instruments. If you want to be a pro gamer doing insane mouse flick 360 no-scope headshots, play a real aim training game and hone your skills. But if you want the sensation of being able to do those amazing feats of mouse-based aiming without having to be a 20-year-old who dedicates all of their time to a single game, well, Rays does a good job distilling that sense that you just pulled off something really cool in a multiplayer shooter without being a multiplayer shooter. It's a small, slight game, but I dug the time I spent crawling up its leaderboards. You know the Voight-Kampff test, that interview in Blade Runner that's designed to determine whether or not someone is a replicant? Well, it turns out someone's made that into a video game, or at least taken the core idea and run with it to create their own cyberpunk narrative game. In Silicon Dreams, released last April by Clockwork Bird, you play as a newly activated android whose job is to perform maintenance on other androids in the Kronos Robotics family by interviewing them and observing their emotional responses to various stimuli. Based on their responses, you will fill out a form indicating what failures, if any, exist, then determine their fate. You can choose to release them, as is, send them in for maintenance, which usually means a partial or complete memory wipe, or decommission them entirely and order a replacement. This is not as easy as it may sound. You're less a mechanic than a psychologist, introspecting the emotions of various artificial people to determine whether they're functioning properly, or indeed what functioning properly even means. Choosing the right thing to do is not always easy, even if what the company wants from you is pretty clear. Is an android that has secretly named itself, taken an interest in film, and started singing to itself as it does its chores defective just because the company that built it says it shouldn't do those things? Should an android that stars in a web show where their owner physically assaults them for views be taken away and have their mind wiped if they like the fame and attention and don't understand the dynamics of abuse because that's all they've ever known? Isn't that kind of punishing the victim? The game is really good at coming up with sci-fi scenarios that don't necessarily have straightforward answers. Filling out the report is also difficult because, well, we did a whole video on perceivable consequence back in the day, and games about the human mind are a good example of the problem. It is at times hard to get a proper handle on the emotional state of these artificial people because if it were super easy and straightforward, it would feel mechanical and simplified and false. So there are all these complications that you might not be able to see that impede your ability to get your job done. Certain conversations can only open up if you establish trust with your subjects, and it isn't always straightforward what responses to what questions necessarily engender trust. Other times, you may need to emotionally manipulate your subjects to get the info you want. For example, high-intensity emotions can block you from pursuing certain lines of questioning, like if your subject is too sad or scared to talk about a particular topic. Other times, they may refuse to talk about certain things unless provoked with extreme anger or fear. You have some tools to help reframe their emotional state, though. Mood lighting, control over their restraints, specific questions designed to provoke a response. <laughs> But you kind of have to plan what you're doing since their efficacy wanes quickly and you can't just ask them the question that makes them mad over and over again.
Finally, there's a constant pressure to do what Kronos Robotics wants you to do, whether you think it's the right thing or not. At the end of each report, you're audited by a third party. The more accurate and company-appropriate your response, the better your review and standing in the company. This leads to swankier offices and access to better tools for manipulating or investigating the mood of your interviewees, but if you cause too many problems or submit too many misdiagnoses, then you yourself might be headed to the scrap pile. So there's this pressure to balance the needs of your subjects and what you think is right with your own well-being. You can't just flip off the company and do the most compassionate thing every time. You will be found out and you will lose the game. Silicon Dreams isn't for everyone. It's extremely text-heavy, and if you're not interested in really investing yourself in the plight of your various subjects, you'll probably bounce off of it. But if you're the kind of person that reads a lot of speculative sci-fi or wants some solid ethical dilemmas framed as an extended homage to cyberpunk as a genre and Blade Runner specifically, Silicon Dreams can be quite captivating. I promise you'll run into at least one or two choices that linger with you after you've made them, turning the consequences of your decisions and their alternatives over and over in your head long after you've stopped playing. And any game that can get me to ponder whether what I did was right, or even defensible, is almost always a game that I enjoy. In Demon Turf, you play as Beebs, a young demon girl with ambitions of becoming the Demon Queen by overthrowing the local demon gangs and challenging the current Demon King for the throne. This will be easier said than done, though. In order to get each gang on her side, she needs to overthrow their bosses and collect enough power to meet the Demon King head-on. The whole thing has a bit of a Disgaea vibe to it, a young demon on the make out to prove themselves to be the rightful ruler of the underworld by force. And that Disgaea sensibility is exaggerated by its decision to render its characters as 2D sprites in a 3D world. This isn't the first time we've seen this kind of thing done. Sprites were the default character models for the first several years of 3D games, and that continues in a lot of retro FPS titles, and games like Paper Mario have 2D characters in a 3D space even today. But it is one of the few times I've seen this style done, and done well, in a skill-based 3D platformer. One of the ways it makes this approach work is that its levels aren't the Super Mario 64 style open playgrounds that encourage exploration to find stars or moons or whatever. They're more the linear 3D platforming challenges that you'd find in Super Mario 3D World. This works to the game's strengths, both in terms of its art design and its platforming mechanics, allowing each level to mix and match jumping puzzles, combat sections, areas where you need to use your newfound tools like a grapple hook or wheel transformation, and more. That's not to say that there isn't any exploration. Some levels have a bit more of an open structure that require you to find all the puzzle keys to unlock the exit, for example, and all of them have hidden cakes placed off the beaten path that can be used as currency to buy upgraded moves. It's a refreshing design philosophy to see on the PC, though. We have a fair number of spiritual successors to Super Mario 64, like Ukulele or A Hat in Time, but not a lot of Super Mario 3D World-style games that focus more on linear level traversal through challenges than exploration-based platforming, at least in 3D. But what makes Demon Turf interesting, aside from its 2D sprites and a 3D world look, is that it tries hard to rework certain aspects of the 3D platformer that have grown a little bit stale, to varying degrees of success. For example, it tries to reinvent the live system that Mario has continued to carry with it long after it has stopped making any sense. Instead of a lives system, Demon Turf allows Beebs to place a marker down at any point in the level where she will respawn if she dies. This looks like a good spot. <laughs> but you only have three checkpoints to place, and if you haven't played through it yet, you don't know how long the level is or where the difficult bits may be. So there's a bit of a gambling dynamic to it. The further you get since your last checkpoint, the more you lose if you miss a jump or die, but you don't want to burn through all of your flags before hitting a real choke point later in the map. Really? Whatever. I don't know if it's a perfect system, but it makes progression markers feel more dynamic and strategic than simply hitting the mid-level flag in a Super Mario level or some invisible checkpoint not of your choosing, and I think it works on the whole. Demon Turf's biggest problems are twofold. One, the camera can be a bit wonky. It isn't unsalvageable, but it can often become a hassle in crowded areas where it may clip through geometry or otherwise obscure your location of where you're trying to land. It's not a huge deal, but it is annoying. The bigger problem is that the combat is, 
Well, I respect it for trying something new. Instead of jumping on enemies or punching enemies or shooting enemies, you have the ability to emit a force field from your fist that can push enemies back and stun them. Your goal is to stun enemies in a submission, then line up a shot that allows you to knock them into the various environmental hazards in each combat arena, knocking them off of platforms, into spikes, that sort of thing. But a third person camera means you're not just lining up an enemy between beebs and a trap, you're lining up beebs and the enemy and the camera and the trap. This isn't hard so much as it feels sloppy to do. Like lining up a single sniper shot in a traditional video game is direct and visceral. It's two points, bam. This feels like you're shooing the enemy to coerce it to the position of your choosing, which tends to take several shots and never really feels great. The game tries to compensate for this by spicing up the combat. Some enemies have shells that need to be removed with a hook shot, for example, and enemies have different attack patterns to learn how to avoid. So it's not bad combat, you're always doing stuff and reacting to the game space, it's not boring. But at the end of the day it feels a bit limp and finicky, especially compared to the really tight, responsive, and expressive jumping and movement mechanics that are the real star of the show. And those work great. Double jumps, glides, forward lunges, chained grapples, different platform effects on movement, slides, wall jumps, rushes, everything you could want is here and it all feels really good. And also, this is easily the biggest game I've talked about today. Each level has two variants, one where you're capturing the territory from the gang, and another harder version after you own the territory that adds sweets you can collect to unlock new clothing and hair variations. There's a soccer mini game and a series of photography quests to unlock additional sweets and cakes, an upgrade tree for different moves that consumes the cakes you collect, and proper boss fights that cap off each gang's set of levels. And there's just a lot here. It's easily one of my favorite platformers that I played in 2021, and certainly one of my favorites for the PC generally. If you're looking for a meaty, pretty indie game to sink your teeth into and enjoy platforming, I would recommend it. Subway Midnight was released in October of 2021 by Bubby Darkstar and published by Going Under developer Agro Crab Games. Much like Demon Turf, what initially attracted me to the game was its art style. But where Demon Turf mixed 2D sprites and a 3D world in a way that was eye-catching but extraordinarily functional, Subway Midnight is a much more aesthetically driven piece. It is, essentially, a horror game where you walk through a subway train possessed by six young ghosts while pursued by a mysterious figure implied to be the one that did them all in. Along the way, you'll learn about the lives and deaths of each of the six ghosts, and in so doing, watch the subway train cars expand to reflect their emotional states, their memories, their abstract inner spaces. It is perhaps one of the most visually arresting games I've played all year, willing to freely play with things like field of view, camera angle, all manner of overlays and post-processing filters and shaders, color grading, lighting, and more, all in order to sell each scene. And really, that's my elevator pitch for the game. It is an adorable horror game that mixes the spooky and cute in equal measure to show you some absolutely bonkers stuff. And I kind of love that. The narrative is mostly just cute fluff to justify the set pieces, but I really like the set pieces. You never quite know what the next room is going to show you, and it is in turn terrifying and beautiful and sometimes banal. As far as the horror itself goes, since I know this isn't the Halloween episode and people who don't play scary games might be curious or trepidatious, I'd probably put it a notch above Oxenfree in intensity. There are two or three solid jump scares in the game, and a handful of subway cars contain genuinely creepy imagery. But the game is never oppressively scary, and it doesn't want to be. The cute character designs and kind of shallow narrative help keep the game from feeling too dark and dour, even when the subject matter turns to death and murder or personal trauma. The only real complaint I have is that it feels obligated to be a bit too much of a game. Each ghost's chapter can be won or lost depending on whether you successfully save them from their nightmares, which requires doing something different for each ghost. If you don't save every single one of them, you get the bad ending, and if you do save all of them, you get the good ending, which is a trope I am on the record as kind of absolutely hating, and 
I kind of hate it here. But Subway Midnight eases the burden of finishing the game correctly by having you replay the chapters only for the kids you didn't save on your next playthrough until you have saved them all. And the game's short enough and pretty enough that correcting the outcomes of a handful of chapters to see the proper ending isn't a huge burden. I don't want to say too much more about it, because even though I love showing off all these wild scenes, part of the joy and terror of Subway Midnight is finding out what waits behind each new door. The more I show, the more I think I can sell you on it, but the more I show, the more I also give away. So I'll leave you with this. Subway Midnight is a gorgeous game that is as spooky as it is adorable, and if that particular tone sounds like something you could jam to, I think you'll really like it. <laughs>